Director General National Museum, I welcome you all to the National Museum Public Lecture today. It is my honor to introduce and welcome the speaker for today, Professor Dr. Anupa Pandey. Without taking much time, may I now hand over the session to our eminent speaker and kindly invite her to the podium and commence the lecture. Over to you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is with immense pleasure that I stand he uh, here to talk to you. And even before I speak, I would really like to thank the National Museum and its Director General and officers of the National Museum, especially Miss Rige, I think was sitting up there who made all the efforts that the painting colors should come right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zavaria. And all the other people here who are involved with the lecture, pardon me if I don't know the names. There are also very senior people here come for the lecture. We had very a very short notice, probably the shortest in the National Museum history of only two days. And it was not Rigay's fault, my fault, the procrastination. But despite that, on a working day, all teachers and students, faculty of various universities, institutes, college and colleges have come. Thank you so much. Art historians and art lovers have come. Thank you so much. So without much ado, I will uh, commence my lecture. My uh, lecture talk is the concept and visualization of Rag Chitra. Uh, and that is, and I would like to illustrate it by the Gem Palace uh, collection of the National Museum. Now, I would like to say that Rag Chitra is a unique genre of miniature painting which amalgamates visual and performing arts form. This talk focuses on investigating the basic notion of Rag Chitra by looking at the Gem Palace, Reserve Gem Palace collection, which is now preserved in the National Museum. It essentially deals with deciphering the meaning of Rag Chitra, its genesis and iconography through the lens of a meticulous methodology. As an expert of Sanskrit language, I mean, it comes as easy to me as Hindi and English, believe me. A trained classical music, music performing artist and an art historian, I have utilized all these disciplines. The study of Rag Chitra is an interdisciplinary study. 
So that is why it needs knowledge of Sanskrit or Braj Bhasha, wherever needed. It needs knowledge of music and of painting also. Further, I would like to tell you that I've been working on this area for the past two decades and in this particular collection and work and all others, I have utilized only original sources, not translations anywhere, that form the strong foundation of this study. Uh, Vike, can you take the next slide? Yes. This can be broadly, the text, I have taken only a few of the sources which I show you. They can be broadly categorized as texts which deal with music and those which re, uh, deal with painting and those with, uh, which deal with the various nuances of rag painting. As I have said that this talk is based on original sources and several ancient and medieval Sanskrit treatises on drama, music, iconography, they have been meticulously studied. Some of the very important ones are, of course, Nati Shastra is the most invaluable text on Indian art and aesthetics, even on painting. And right down, you can see from the 2nd century BC to the 18th century, each and every text, the Sangeet Raj of Radha Kumbha is this thick a text, about, I think, 1500 pages. I read it page to page. So after that, I ventured to do this study. Uh, next, this lecture, I will give you the structure of the lecture so that you do not have a problem in understanding what is unfolding. The lecture seeks to address the aforesaid questions and is divided into three parts. The first part adumbrates the history of Indian music. The second part elaborates upon the process of the transformation of the audible content, that is the rag, into a visual component, rag chitra. The third part analyzes select rag chitra folios from the Gem Palace collection with regard to their theme, iconography and textual content. Slide. Next. Uh, now, I must give you a very brief idea about the history of Indian music. Only then can you understand the transition to rags and then further to the paintings of the rag. The history of Indian music is the Dantishasra Bharat deals with two distinct forms of Indian music, Gandhar and Dhruva Gan. In fact, the first Statement of his 28th chapter on music says, Samabhyasi Ganam Tasmad Bhavam Ganam. Sam, Gandhar, and Gan. Those, he doesn't talk of Sam that is out by that time, that was Vedic music. He talks of two basic types of music of the day at that time. They were Gandhar and Dhruva Gan. Gandhar music represents the classical form of those times. While Dhruva Gan or Gan represents the popular music of the theater, like a cinema music now or theater, molded to suit the structure and atmosphere of dramatic plots. Whereas the purpose of Gandharva ga music was transcendental, it is called Adrishtabhar, transcendental maybe. It was heavily sacred and ritualistic, and improvisation was not much allowed. The purpose of Dhuva Gan was primarily Rakti of pleasure or that is Drishthal. And so you can understand how the idea of rags comes from the uh, Ranjan of pleasure. This lecture primarily deals with Dhruva Gan forms of music which were expressed or sung through melodic forms such as Gram Rags, Bhasha, Vibhasha and very importantly Rags. Now, you must be wondering as to where do you get the, since I've read all of these texts, where was the earliest reference, textual reference, at least to Rags? I found this in the 7th century text, the Brihad Deshi, which you saw in the day, of Matam. Matam clearly states, I quote, next, next. Matam clearly states, 
that which is pleasing to people is called rag unquote. In fact, the etymology of the word rag is derived from the Sanskrit root ranj, which means to please as also to color. Matam distinguishes between the marg and the deshi forms of music. I mean, Gandharva and Gan are there, but they are categorized into two styles of music. Marg and deshi are styles, not the name of the uh, of these um, music in particular, which he says may be roughly rendered as classical and popular. Rags being the deshi or popular form. In fact, I quote from Matang again. He says, "Abla bal gopa le shiti bal le nije chaya gheete sanu ragen swadeshi deshi ruchate." That is that which is called deshi. What is it? It is sung spontaneously by children, women, cowherds, and kings in their own province with love and melody sanu ragen, as you have popular cinema and music today sung by all classes of people. Till about the thirteenth century. When Sharang Re Dev wrote his Sangeet Ratnakar, which is a landmark actually, Indian music grew through a continuous process of popularization and standardization, which led to the evolution of the rag ragini system. It may be noted that the 12th century text Aprajit Pricha, Aprajit Pricha is basically Shankshasan text, where one chapter is devoted to rag and raginis. It seems to foreshadow the concept of rag ragini by naming six principal rags and their derivative melodic forms. It is interesting to note that the word ragini has not been mentioned until the 15th century. In so far, the history of Indian music and rags has been discussed. The points point raised now is how these rags were transformed. From an audible to a visual medium, assuming the form of rag chitra. Set next. <coughs> what was the genesis of rag chitras? How was it that an abstract form, a murtru, was made manifest into concrete form, murtru, in a material medium? I would, at the outside or outset here, also like to elucidate upon the concept of rag chitra. The concept of rag chitra is an interesting one, in which melodic modes of classical Indian music, that is rags, are painted as concrete manifestations in visual art chitra. A significant aspect of understanding the audio-visual component of the rag chitras. Can be discerned by scrutiny of the chitrapad or the text often given in the painting itself. Each rag chitra has a specific iconography that corresponds with the chitrapad. In fact, chitrapad is a technical term culled by me from the 15th century text Sangeet Raj authored by Rana Kumbhak Mewar. See, basically, the painting is you can see the painting they. And the mustard border on top, in which they wrote the chitrapad, that was written first, then the painting was made. And <clears throat> I'm sorry to say that many art historians, most of them, in fact, actually ignore the chitrapad because it is very difficult to decipher old Devanagari. And worse still, you do not get the hang of the Sanskrit or the Braj Bhasha written there. Now, I have translated and deciphered forty-two of them in this. It took me five years. Anyway, the earliest representation of rags. Next, next, the earliest representation. So, where do you see the earliest representation of rags? How are the rags made into chitrasna? It seems to me that it first came in the sacred context. It seems to be the dhyan on the presiding deities of the rag. In earlier musicological texts. Only the melodic structures of the rags are mentioned. There is no mention of rag dhyanas. That is, the meditations on the form of a rag before commencing singing, or the deities associated with it. It is passed since the dhyanas were often secretly imparted from the guru to the shishya. It is possible they were not penned down. Even now, when you receive in a very traditional manner, they impart. They tell you, rag ke surup pe dhyan do. 
you, you think of your deity and then come and sing in the ram. In the 13th century, the Sangeet Ratnakar became the earliest available text to give an indication as to the presiding deity of each ram. However, no specific dhyans are given in the Sangeet Ratnakar. By the 15th century, Ram dhyans are seen in the Sangeet Raj of Rana Kumbha. These dhyans are religious in nature. They generally describe the color, the garment and the vahan or vehicle of the deity ascribed to the Ra. They then are the sources of the earliest pictorial representation of Indian melodies or Ra Chitras. Next slide please. The earliest surviving, this is one of the earliest surviving Ra Chitras are those painted in the West Indian tradition on the back of a Kalp Sutra manuscript dated to about 1475 AD. This Kalp Sutra folio depicts six multi-headed male deities labelled as Rags, which are Shri, Vasan, Bhairav, Pancham, Meg, and Naptanarayan. These female figures are called interestingly Bhashas, not Raginis, in the earlier format. The earliest secular Ragdhyans are not found before the 16th century. These show a completely different iconography. Some humming, no? But anyway, this is because these paintings are no longer dhyanro for the musician. But it is important that they are painted for the consumption of kings and aristocrats who were the patrons who got these paintings commissioned. Their purpose was drisht halna, that is ranjan, rakti or pleasure. The Ram Chitras painting, uh, the paintings executed between the 16th to the 19th centuries in Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar uh, Central India, Pahari region depict an iconography which may be broadly classified into two major types. The first type depicts a religious iconography, but it was not based on Dhyan Mantras. The imagery was based on the religious preference of the court patron. The second type is courtly, depicting from, ranging from depicting Naik Naika uh, as royal personages or aristocrats to the depiction of a situation which helps in the evocation of the Ras of the Rag or Ragini. After giving an overview of history of classical Indian music and its manifestation in the arts, primarily in the form of Rag Chitra, I will now proceed toward a, next, towards a textual and aesthetic analysis of select Rag Chitras from the Gem Palace uh, collection of the National Museum. Uh, I want to tell you that this dates to about approximately the mid 17th century from the Mewar School of Painting. And this was probably an imperial collection, which I say, it, uh, the artists have not penned their names, but it is uh, extremely sophisticated in character. And often in many paintings, the imperial insignia, the sun, is seen because of this. Numbering 42 in all, the Gem Palace folios embody an eclectic array of themes, deities, seasons, rust, night, naika, bhed, etc. Since it will be impossible to discuss the textual content and iconography of so many due to paucity of time, I have selected a few folios belonging to different themes, exemplifying different rasas. The paintings have a uh, next, <coughs> they have a standard pictorial format, <coughs> that is the space of the paintings, a mustard bordered on top, in which the uh, Chitrapad is written. Uh, I, as again I said, please pardon the lack of modesty which I was now, but you know, it has been such a struggle these, I told you, I have read scholars writing on this particular collection and not name, leaving scholars saying the script is corrupt. It is no way corrupt. There are three scribes who have done the different paintings. This is the best scribe here. When I saw it, <coughs> you see, the words are not different. A, it's a little uh, dif uh, difficult to decide with the old Ek Nagri. The first is she. C likha is she. The next word is not Mudhanisha, it is Kha, Shikhandi. So you have to know how to decipher Old Devnagari. The second problem is it's all running in one way. 
there is no you don't know where the words are demarcated so i you know i read and i was puzzled as i could decipher then i started reading it and i'm telling you how it came to me and when i read the meter was na 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 and it immediately hit me that this is the upjati meter thankfully i know my sanskrit like a pandit and many of the verses are in upjati not 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 all of them the moment i discovered that this is upjati then i knew that this line it is running in a running formation it is a verse it is not prose so then according to the meter i started separating the words and bam there you had it the words it's like i opened the i got the right key among 5000 keys and i opened the door but still in some of the this is a well written scribe in the last scribe in the last painting the scribe is totally it's a very bad scribe so there what i did the lacunae i filled with the exigencies of the meter i realized what meter it is i filled in and it made sense that is how the deciphering of the meters and then i sat and translated all these 42 verses it took me the art part didn't take me much time but and i can tell you when i speak on the rags what a big folly it is to leave out the text they really illustrate it's just because you can't do it you leave out the text is not right they really you have to make the for the illustrate the iconography of the painting so anyway uh the criteria of selection i come to that uh next uh the criteria of selection it was hard uh i took a one select collection because you know i have worked on all the collections from various sub schools of rajasthan from central india from pahari but the iconography varies quite a lot sometimes so i took up one particular set which i had worked upon with the text and the criteria of selection are i have taken some of seasons where the iconography is very standard and uniform throughout the different schools then i have taken up the ras rag chitras illustrating various rasas and along with that various nayak nayika bhet so <clears throat> this is the first one is vasantragini you can see what a fabulous painting it is and i thank devia for we've been struggling to get the right colors how important it is to get the right color and it is in the meter of jati and you i you know with great pleasure i read the verse to you which i translated it says vasantaragini shikhandi barhochay baddh chunda pushyan pikam chuta latam kure bhraman muda vasam anang murti manoharoyam cha vasantaraga the translation is with the top knot head tied by a heap of peacock feathers nourishing the kukku by the mango sprout wandering around with pleasure in his dwelling places the image of god of love he is charming and is called vasantra the choice of vasantra chitra from this collection i have told you is testifies to the standardization followed in the iconographic representation of this ra through various schools of literature it is really very unvarying i would like to tell you this the artist has represented the season of spring chet mahina when spring comes uh, which with krishna dancing and rejoicing the festival of holi in the company of three gopis <coughs> while krishna plays a flute one of the gopi beats a tambourine while another plays a cymbals the third gopi sprays colored water from a syringe which can also be seen in the foreground along with water pitchers in the piazi pink ground that uh, contained colored water kept a mix clumps of yellow and white flowers the lacquer red background is adorned with clumps of flowers reminiscent of the mughal hashias the painting is a visualization of vasantotsa where the where anang or god of love has been replaced by krishna in indian culture the season of spring is synonymous to the melodious sound of koyal and mango sprays mentioned in the chitrapan and a convention which has been consistently followed by the artists for this rag chitra as well 
It is noteworthy that the oral and visual traditions of Vasant continue with these specific aspects even until the 20th century, as is evident in <coughs> popular <coughs> Indian cinema music today. See? <laughs> This is in Ragvasanth, in a film song in the 20th century. And then the Aamki Bor and Koyal. Amma ki dali pe gaye mat wali, Koyaliya kali nirali. See, what I'm trying to emphasize to you, not just by showing you the paintings, but by the music itself, that the continuity of Indian tradition in all its, in its cultural, festive, musical, artistic uh, contexts, all of them, from the 17th century of the same iconography, which is being repeated in the cinema songs even to date. Next. Next is uh, the Hindol Ra. Hindol Ra is uh, the, the words which I have translated here. It says, Ra Hindol. Nitambini. See, the first scribe is a little different. Hindol Rikrakha. Ra Hindol. It says, Nitambini Mand Tarangitasu, which I have trans translated it like this. Dola Sukela. Sukhama Dadhanaha. Kapot karbur diti karburasya hindol ragaha kathito manindre. So I translated it like this being gently rocked in a beautiful swing by a fair hipped dancer and bearing the happiness of this beautiful sport. Lustrous grey, like the throat of the pigeon, is the one described as hindol ra by the best of sages. Now the word hindol means a swing. In Indian culture, it is invariably connected with rainy season or savan, as one is reminded of the joyful mood of swinging during rains. In you have in the you can see this is what is being depicted here: the rainy season, and you have the Teach festival during savan, where the jhula, the swings are, and even to date, whether it is 17th century or 21st century. You have the, the swings are in the most important part of the iconography still today. The iconography of Hindol is thus intrinsically connected with the illustration of the swings on the trees in the rainy season. And I would like to say again, this is an imagery that is still popular in Indian cinema music today. <clears throat> there is one song which says, Savan ke jhole. So Savan ke jhule, you see in the painting of mid 17th century or 20th century, you still have the same iconography. Next. <coughs> The next two paintings, uh, slides, depict the Bhakti Ras. So I was showing you the Caesians and I want to tell you Vasant and Hindol have a very standard iconography throughout the various schools. So does Bhairvi, that's why I've chosen it. Uh, they depict Bhakti Ras, however, I would like to tell you that they are completely different in their representations and in the essence of their representations. Same iconography in painting, but the, the sense that you unfolds to you is different. Uh, not Bhairavi, one is Khambhavati, of course. Bhairavi is sensuous and evocative in nature, whereas the next Bhakti Ras, which I will show you, is Khambhavati, has metaphysical connotations and several layers of meanings. So, here I have deciphered the words like this. Nadbhervi ragini, sarovarastha svatikasya mandape. 
सरोरुहै शंकरम अर्चयन्ति तालक प्रयोग प्रति सन्नतांगे गौरी शुचिरनाद सुभय रुहे The translation uh, which I've done is as follows. In the crystal shrine situated on the lake, worshipping Shankar by lotuses, with a well-formed body bent forward for playing the tal, fair and bright, she is the beautiful Nad Bhairavi. As the nomenclature suggests, uh, Bhairavi, who is a consort of Bhaira worship, sings this ragini in adoration of Shiv. This is the standard iconographic depiction across various schools uh, and it consists basically of a lady, lady worshipping the Shiv Ling that is invariably placed in a shrine besides a water body. Can you take the next slide? Uh, <coughs> however, I would like to, I am showing you two uh, Bhairavi Ragchitras, but one from Mewar, which I've been showing you, and one from uh, Bundi. I would like to comment on the Bhuri, Bundi Bhairavi Ragni rather than the Gem Palace. Both give the same iconography, but the Gem Palace is a little prosaic, and Bundi Ragchitra is really evocative. The artist in this Rag Chitra depicts an animated and powerfully evocative view of nature. What is this evocative new? You can see it, you can smell it, and you can hear it. It is amazing. You cannot, all three things. The viewer can not only see the painting, but it extends to enhancing the olfactory and auditory experience altogether. Now, the sense of smell. Can you smell the painting? I can. See, look at the jasmine. <laughs> And the lotuses and the heavy, in, 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 uh, the, the air is heavy with the smell. And the, how is the artist further suggested it to you? The bees are all hovering around. So the sense of smell is powerfully conveyed to you. It is for you as an artist, as an art lover to be able to smell it because I can. Then... One can hear the cacophony of various birds and animals in this painting. Generally, the viewer's attention is engaged by the environment. You can see, look at the parrots. Uh, <coughs> yeah, there is a harsh screeching of the parrots. Parrots really screech a lot. Then, if you have heard the peacocks, they have a very raspy sort of a sound. It is not melodious. Then here, yeah, you can see the crow. You can hear the caw, caw, caw of the crow. And then the frogs come out from here, from the pond. So you can hear the tar, tar, tar of the frogs. So there is a harsh sounds cacophony all around. The artist has created this because you can suddenly hear the very melodious voice of this lady singing Bhairavi in the center. So it offsets, it is beautifully offset, this beautiful singing of the uh, Bhairavi Ragni by the lady. And who's seen playing the symbols also for a bhajan. Then it is a visually beautiful, beautiful painting. You can see that in the, either it is the very, very early morning before sunrise or at the time of sunset, the beauty is Bhairavi Ragni is, can be sung at all times of the day. So, there is a slight darkness either before sunrise or late evening and you can see the pristine white marble that contrasts in the shadows of the evening. You can see the dark blue of the lake and the white marble skin of the lady and uh, the fluorescence of the fauna, colored fauna all around that you see, even the squirrels prancing, the shivling outside, it is abounding, it is, the, there are a lot of beautiful contrasts of color, it is a visually beautiful painting, there is a whole amount of sounds, smell, beauty in, uh, in visuals, so it is uh, you can see the pond also is actually, it's a very animate painting. The pond also is alive, absolutely. There are a whole lot of 
ducks, tiger fish, cranes, etc. You can see the lotus is half open, fully open, and buds in a very this is a very formulaic manner coming right down from Sanchi only. So it is a very animate painting which gives you a full experience of the, as I said, the visual, the olfactory, and the auditory senses. Next. Very different in nature. They are both bhaktiras. But this is the Kambavati Ragini, which is very different in nature. So I will first uh, read the verse which I have deciphered, which is Kamaiti Ragini. Vaso Vasana Sharadan Shushubram Pullavadatam Chaturananasya Viranji Vedi Parikarma Sakta Kambavati Lakshma Vichitra Seva. Wearing an apparel which is white like the autumnal moonbeams, dressed like the blooming white flowers, the four-faced one with the ability to adorn the Vedi for Brahma, Kambavati is characterized by this marvelous service. This word, Vichitra Seva, is extremely important. You see, there is, uh, yes, another factor. You have not only to know music, you have to know art, you also have to know religion and theology to understand these paintings. My understanding, I when I Vallabhacharya and the Pushti Marg is very important to understand Rajasthani miniature paintings. Word Vichitra Seva, which is marvelous service in English translation, is fine, but here too it is heavily laden with meaning. Which it, I didn't recognize it in the first go. It took me a lot of time to understand all the various levels of meaning that are there in this painting. So here Kambavati is depicted at both the denotative and connotative levels of meanings. The painting at the denotative level, at the prima facie level, it shows, it represents the worship of Brahma. He is conducting a Vedic sacrifice helped by two ladies. The bearded faces of Brahma are very well painted. I would love to comment on the aesthetics but I have to go on and cut short. He holds the book or the veil in one of his four hands. A yajja or religious sacrifice is taking place. Now, I would like to tell you that the yajja signifies the cosmos. This is a very well known thing, known in the Rig Veda. The Rit has several layers of meaning. One is a yajja also. Brahma is a creator. The Jain palace Kambavati Rag Chitra symbolizes the entire creation, the symbol of which is the Yajika Vedi, which symbolizes the cosmos there. It may be noted that in Hindu philosophy, Srishti or creation is said to be compounded of Pancha Mahabhut or five elements, namely water, fire, earth, sky and ether. Brahma is also said to be Srashta or creator of the five elements. Four are quite clearly seen in this painting. Water, fire, earth, sky. In fact, if one notices a very, uh, this red line which has been purposely put here to demarcate the sky from the ether actually here. So the, all the five elements are here, the Panchma <coughs> Um at a deeper level, the painting reflects a significant rendition of the Srashta of Brahma, his Srishti as this can we have this humming sound? Thank, thank you. So we have Brahma, uh, the Srashta, his Srishti as compounded in the Panch Mahabhut and the yajya or ritual fire as representing the bridge between the microcosm and the macrocosm and beyond. Now the text says that Khambhavati is engaged in preparing the altar Vedi of the fire ritual yajya for the worship of Brahma. Accordingly, two women are shown carrying offerings, offering, pouring oblations of the fire of the sacred altar. As I mentioned, the term Vichitra Seva I found very interesting. It is purposefully put. There is nothing that is rigid, redundant in the Chitrapad here actually. It is interesting and it has a technical connotation in the Vallabhachari cult which was very popular in Rajasthan during these times. 
Seva is a technical term, which it indicates both sadhan bhakti as differentiated from sadhya bhakti. Seva is serving the Lord through the chanting of his names and worshipping his forms through various rituals, jap, puja, havan. This may be purely ritualistic or the ritual may be accompanied with ragathmic bhakti, that is emotion. The seva indicated here is a preparation and ornamentation of the altar. It may be pointed out that women are known to have prepared the vedis or altars of the yaji right since Vedic times. I would like to say that the rag khambhavati is no longer sung. Next. Now, this is, uh, I would come to a, another concept, the visualization of the ras and naika bhed in Rakshatras. The concept of Ras forms the foundation of Indian aesthetics and its earliest uh, description is in the uh, sixth chapter of the Nati Shastra. Later on it develops more by the 6th uh, century AD Vishnu Dharmutta, we have Shantras and then it goes on more and more to the medieval period. You have seen several Rasas, even Bhakti Ras. The concept of Naik Naika Bhed is also given in the Natishas. Very few people know this. But the basic Ashtanaika. Both these concepts first arose in the context of theatre, but were later extended to poetry, literature, and visual arts. Now, this is the Dhanasiri Ragani, Dhanashri. It says, the, te the verse says, Dhanasiri Ragani. Durva dal sham tanur manogya kantam likhanti phalakai kahasta bala gal lochal lochan vari bandubhe nidvirdhoya dhanashri tamabhyanakti. The last line was very difficult to do. Anyway, with the body dusky as a durva grass heap, charming and drawing the lover with a drawing board in one hand, the maiden dhanashri by tear drops falling from her eyes wipes it, the picture, and then anoints it again. One of the most popular ras to be depicted in Indian arts is Shingar ras, which finds its first mention in the Nati Shastra, and it is said to be of two types, Vipralam, love and separation, and Sayo, love and union. The concept of separation and love finds mention even in the ancient tree texts such as Meghdur by Kalidas, where the separated knife draws an image of his beloved. The iconography of Dhanashri is that of a dusky woman drawing the picture of an absent or a lover or husband. This is the Vipralam Shankar. And the Naika here is the Proshit Patika Naika, technically. It is the Proshit Patika Naika is one whose husband has gone away. Such a Virahani Naika can be seen seated drawing an image of a beloved on a board. So, the, it, as I said, this is Vipralam Shringar. The intensity of her emotion, you cannot understand that. The beautiful thought, till you decipher the verse. It is a verse, when I decipher that, which elucidates the actual context of the painting. Why is she drawing? What is she doing? It says, what does the text say? The text says, that her tears of separation keep falling on the board. Because they are falling on the board, the painting keeps getting rubbed off. And then she keeps drawing, redrawing the thing, figure. You know, it is so interesting that again there is an old Hindi cinema song of Talat Memo, which I understood only after I did this painting. It says, This banata so, tasveer kyo nahi banti hai? I never could understand. Why, why is the tasveer not being made? When I saw, this is 28th century, but to get the answer, I got it in the Ram Chitra painting of the 17th century, which where the text clarifies ki tasveer kyo nahi banti. Next. Now, this is Sringar Ras in Madhu Madhavi Ragni and the Naika is the Abhisarika Naika. Uh, I have translated, I have uh, deciphered the, the verse here is not actually complete. There are only two parts or two lines, 
बट दिस सिग्निफिकेंट क्योंकि ब्लू ड्रेस की बात कर रहे हैं मूविंग इन द डार्कनेस ऑफ द नाइट इट से मधु माधवी रागिणी नीलम निचोलम व पुषा वहंती प्रियानुरागा मधु माधवी वेरिंग ऑन अ बॉडी अ डार्क ब्लू ड्रेस विथ लव फॉर अ बिलव विच शी इज मधु माधवी ये अभिसारिका नायिका इवोकेटिव नाउ दिस इज अ संभोग श्रृंगार रस लव इन यूनियन एंड द नायिका इज अभिसारिका एंड दिस इज वन ऑफ द मोस्ट पॉपुलर प्रोटेगनिस्ट नॉट ओनली इन पेंटिंग इन लिटरेचर एंड ऑल आर्ट्स शी इज अ डेरिंग लेडी the one who goes out for a rendezvous defies all the obstacles and is fearless of the consequences usually it is assumed that the abhisarika nayika goes out in the night night but i read many texts on nayika bhed also and i discovered for instance the ujwal neelmani of rup goswami says that he talks of both the tamasi and the jyotsni abhisarika tamasi meaning like our abhisarika who is going on a dark moonless stormy night jyotsni on a full moonlight there are others also in rasmanjiri also you have different there are many different categories of even abhisarika now the bold character of this prema abhisarika nayika is revealed to the nayak in a very beautiful verse of from the rasik priya which i would like i translated it for you here the nayak questions the abhisarika nayika who's coming on a dark stormy night to me he says as to how come she came uninvited she says the garland of dark clouds summoned to me then he says when asked how she saw the path in such darkness she said the lightning guided to me the night further questions as how could she walk the path full of muds and thorns which meandered up and down and she very provocatively she answered that her impetuosity and the elephant gait gajgamini by which she you know it rendered it plausible finally he asks in this dark dreadful night how did she dare to wander alone and the nayika quit no my soul me it was my love that helped me so it is so apt actually here the rag chitra from the gem palace collection displays all these elements the nayika wearing a dark blue wrap so that she becomes she is very fair but she wears dark she get invisible in the night she is enticed towards a peacock on the tree which symbolizes her lover her restraining sakhi her restraining sakhi who is seen advising her against going out the bhav of utsah or enthusiasm is further enhanced as the nayika is not deterred with the frightful weather depicted with the serpentine lightning bolts next this is the do i have 5 10 minutes uh स्वर्ण प्रभा भास्वर भूषणा नीलम निचोलम सुतन वहंते कांते पादो पातम अधिष्ठते मानोन्नता रामगिरी प्रतिष्ठा सम ऑफ देम व्हिच आर इन द ब्रैकेट्स यू नो द वर्सेस द आई हैड टू पुट एन इंसर्ट देम टू मेक द लाइन कंप्लीट एंड बट आई हैव डन इट स्ट्रिक्टली अकॉर्डिंग टू मेट्रिकल एक्सिजेंसीज दैट हैज नेवर बीन ओवरलुक्ड नाउ इट्स इट इज ट्रांसलेटेड एज विद अ ऑर्नामेंट सिंटिलेटिंग विद अ लस्टर ऑफ गोल्ड वेयरिंग अ डार्क ब्लू बॉडीस ऑन अ ब्यूटीफुल बॉडी विद अ लवर स्टैंडिंग नियर हर फुट such is the manonnata described as ramgiri the chitrapad you can see and the chitra construe very well the manonnata nayika is seated in a chamber here with a betel leaf in her hand and her head turned away from the nayak she is somehow displeased with him and she is acting arrogant he has come from outside as is indicated by slippers see the slippers are here so he is left his slippers outside 
and he dares to come only up to the threshold. He doesn't dare to come near her really. Uh, he sits kneeling at the feet of the Naika, trying to appease her, but she does not look at him. Or of the Ashtanaika, Ashtanaika is one of the Bhets, there are many other, very popular one Ashtanaika. This is the Swadhin, Swadhin Bhartrika Naika, uh, one whose husband, one who has a husband in subjugation, complete command. This is the classic situation normally, wherein the Naika is in a wrathful mood and the Naik bends over, literally and figuratively to appease her. The Yakshin Megdut with a mineral chow draws himself prostrate on his feet, begging forgiveness of his beloved. But here his wife is angry because he's away, not because he has committed a, some mistake. Generally, such extreme modes of forgiveness are sought only after the lover is indulged in some indiscretion. A more typical situation is seen in the Vikram of Vishyam of Kalidas, where the queen discovers Urvashi's letter addressed to the king. He begs forgiveness by falling on his feet. The Amru Shatakam also describes the situation when the erring husband falls to the feet of his wife, who appears manini as her pride has been offended. This rag is now sung as Ramkali actually, which is a name also given in the Sangeet Damodar. <clears throat> Next. Now, this is a very amazing Ram Chitra. It is Asabri. And what you see here is the Adbhutras. And so the meter also, the chanda also is a little different. Uh, it was uh, This was also difficult to decipher and translate, but I could do it because I discovered this is a Vasantilak meter in which it is. Uh, I have deciphered it as thus. Asavari Ravani. Shri Khanda Shail Shikhar Shikhar uh, Shikhare Parisanni Vashta Matanga Mauti Chitra Mota Chitram Chitrotam Harvalli Akrish Chandan Taro Dadati Bujangi Asavari Malay Manjula Neel Kanti, which has been translated as seated on the summit of a sandalwood mountain. Wearing a picturesque, excellent necklace of elephant beads, it says, that is ivory actually. Having pulled out from the sandalwood tree a she serpent and bearing it, Asavri has the beautiful luster of the Malay mountains. Asavri Ragni illustrates Arbhutras and it has a very consistent iconography across various schools, which is representation of a woman in a forest surrounded by snakes and uh, you can see this here over here uh, the rag chitra from the gem palace collection depicts a dark skinned woman dressed in a wondrous tribal fashion holding a snake you notice that the trees here are not laden with fruits or flowers but instead encircled with snakes the black snakes with their imbricated bellies and poisonous fangs are naturalistically painted, as also their movement coiling around the trees and crawling on the ground. They are simply everywhere. It is a strange but extraordinary scene, both ter terrifying and yet fascinating. In fact, a mixture of some element of Bhayana and Ras is also here, but Adbhutras, <coughs> it is wondrous. I think in the most natural of surroundings is laid out a most unnatural scene. Next. We come to the last painter. Five minutes uh, the, This is the uh, Rag Sindhuri. And here, do you notice that the writing has really changed from the neat writing. There are three scribes, I told you, in this. And the <coughs> writing here, it was extremely difficult. This verse really harassed me a lot. Because A, it was very difficult to decipher the script. And B, 
there are mistakes in the script also but anyhow when some parts have been left out in the end i managed to do it and it says rag sindhuri turangam skandha nibaddha bahu swarna prabha bhushan varna gatra sangram bhumi vicharan pratapi and the last line is really broken nato yah then it is broken rang then it is broken again it says ragini sindhu that is it says with the arm placed on the shoulder of a horse with his body brilliant with the golden luster of ornaments pratapi that is a valorous one moving about in the battle field like an actor on stage is called ragini sindhu now the variants of this rag are mentioned in various texts such as the sangeet ratnaka sangeet raj and also rag vibhod vibhod of the 17th century which in fact mention that the rag is mentioned for veer and adbhut ras however the verse of this rag chitra as i have already mentioned is most corrupt and full of errors visually it is a very important painting both historically and politically because it seems to me a my interpretation is so the verse seems to refer to the haldi ghati battle of mewar hence justifying the use of the brilliant haldi yellow in the background that you notice it is a very strange uh, haldi yellow that is there in the background clearly saying to you that this is the haldi ghati in fact i went to the haldi ghati when i was working on this i touched the soil and it just then wipe off my fingers were stained yellow i had to wash it off i want to tell you this so it is really very yellow even to date <clears throat> and rana pratap is connoted here as pratapi the word pratapi comes here the valorous one and also it means rana pratap and his horse chetak chetak is turangam skandani baddha babu which i mentioned to you the horse and the valorous one are mentioned rana pratap or pratapi is a valorous one and his horse chetak are deliberately connoted but not explicitly mentioned here this is because rana pratap actually lost the battle from raja man singh kachwaha uh, so the mewar never really accepts that this is a defeat you know they they always say it is a very valorous battle which it what is saying here the political and historical factors of the moguls won the battle uh, but how did the venet is also suggested in this painting rana man singh of kachwa is shown here uh, as the one on the elephant you can see the royal insignia here and note the strategic placing of the hoor here every element means something why have they put it what was the point of putting this persian hoor over here there was a very big point it is imperative to note that a persian hoor on an angel is deliberately placed indicating that the battle was won on account of destiny rather than courage which is associated with rana pratap an embodiment of vidas so i would like to conclude uh, next <clears throat> by saying that the vast repertoire of indian miniature painting constitutes an invaluable part of a heritage painted primarily for royal and courtly consumption this art flourished throughout the 16th century onwards and led to the fruition of different schools among the myriad themes that found expression in the visual medium a distinct genre illustrating melodies of classical indian music or rags and raginis evolved during this uh, from the 16th to the 19th centuries in rajasthan malwa punjab hills and the deccan these paintings called rag chitra represent a confluence of the audible with the visual and were executed with great elegance the concept of rag chitras entailed immortalizing melodies by means of deification and personification at times investing them with a more profound meaning the depiction of certain rags and raginis was also based on their performance or the emotion or ras that they evoked 
the specific formulae iconography assigned to each type translates visually into a unique design. Thank you. Yes, can you have the lights on? I'd like to see you. Yeah. I would also just like to tell you that this is the book that I have written on this entire and this book contains not only the Mewar collection of uh, mid-17, there is a fabulous Mewar collection in the Bharat Kala Bhavan of about 1575. I've taken both. In fact, I would like to say that Mewar was a great home for rock chitras. 1575, you have some of the earliest ones to 1605 of Chawand. 1627 Sahib and then 1650 around 1650 this collection so I have very paintings of the other schools I also have. thank you I'm Dr. Manapri. Um, hello to everyone. Uh, Ma'am, before I put up my question, I would like to thank the National Museum and most importantly you for bringing this talk uh, alive and making it so enchanting for us. Thank Rige, who's put in a lot of effort in Zavaria for this. I thank both of them. No, Ma'am, but we were completely enamored with your it's singing. Really it has actually, the rock chitras have come alive for us because of you today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. What is your question? Um, Ma'am, from an artist's point of view, I wish to ask, how does he visualize the adrishta rag into a visual form so that the evocation is the same in the visual format as it is for a musician? Oh. See, the adrisht form, as I told you, was a component of the earlier, you may sit down, of the earlier Gandhar music, which uh, unfortunately it is too ancient now, we really do not know what the structures were. Uh, but the Dhruva Gan was a first, that was a music of the theater. And it says, when you read in detail, it says different types of music are played in the hero heroina meeting, if a villain comes, if something, if they, Sandhi, in the different Sandhis. Like even now in film music, if there is a romantic scene, nothing wrong is happening, then you know it's okay. Horror movie, mein, jaise dhruvagan change hota hai na, I go outside the room. I know something is going to happen because the music changes. So all this is mentioned in the Nati Shasa. Now this idea seems, because the idea was Ranjan or Rakti of pleasure, Ras. So Rag is, the Rag paintings are Ras for the Rasik. So they evolve in iconograph, you know, it is the Ras they have to evoke. As I told you, because they are no longer only Dhyan Mantras or religious, but they are for the courtly consumption of the patrons. So Vasant, for instance, Vasant ke actually, it's, it will be very long to tell you, but I actually have investigated Ratnavali of 7th century area also. Vasant Otsav ka kafi festival hota tha, where they have said that the paintings of the Vasant festival made Chitrogat. Maybe some of these ancient traditions were taken over. Then Vasant is connected with Chev, with Holi, with the Koyan, with Mango. All these elements were ta taken up uh, as the by the iconographist and then inserted by the artists. But uh, it was the iconography it seems to have evolved first, but not before 16th century. So they ultimately transforming the transcendent or the adrish for the Ras to for the rasik of the quotes there. Okay, so moment you see the Vasant Rag painting here to the Indian mind and you and you read the verse, you know, that joy of Vasant Rag comes, um, for those of you who are um, from music here, Thagwa Bridge Dekhan Ko Chala this is a very famous composition in the text. Unfortunately, I don't remember it. 
तो ये वसंत राग में ही है दिस थिंग दिस कमिंग एज टेकन ओवर थिंग यस रीजन Thank Can you. you form a club where you invite us all to be a member and give us one lecture a month at least? <laughs> Please, <laughs> so invigorating your whole lecture and your Thank knowledge. You must share it with us. <laughs> Please do that. Who I asked Rige the problem she had why she could only do it in two days. I'll tell you, it was not ah. Rige's fault. From the Which past three I months, she has been badgering me. I help her. I was a voluntary guide when I did my museology, <laughs> and uh, now I'm doing nothing. So I'll help you, help her, whatever is needed. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I will definitely. Please take down your. I don't have your phone number. Sure. Yeah, I know, but uh, I, all of you, such you come from such a long distance also for my lecture in such a short time. Shweta, you may kindly note her number. You, you, you are made a very big offer. Okay, whether the club or not, I'm going to capitalize on your help, please. Okay. Excellent. Yes, I think. Can you allow one more? Well, I think she needs one. Oh, I, I mean, that's just give her a mic. Actually, I don't have a question. I'm speechless. So, what can I ask? <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm sorry. I, if you may, ask. no, no. Ma'am, we've always heard the term rag mala, hmm. but not rag chitra. Hmm. So, is it the same? Or? No, it's not. That's what I actually. I was so worried that I would overstep Rigi's Zavaria's instructions of one hour that I condensed this a lot. The thing is, if you see the word, reflect upon the word rag mala. Mala can never be singular. In a mala, there are several beads. So, if there are a list of whole folio of rag paintings, that can be put as rag mala, because uh, rag mala paintings ki ladiya. But in the singular, how can you call it rag? You cannot call rag mala painting. Paintings different. So, I'm a stickler for. Correct, correct thing. So I insist on only rag chitra, that rag painting. Because so you can connote that even in the singular, but rag paintings that can be rag mala. Not at all. Okay, all right. Yeah. So thank you very much. I really want to thank everyone and all of you. This hall, I am amazed that even in two days' time, it's almost all full. I really thank all of you because I know it is so hard to get leave on a working day to leave your classes, etc. And yet, so many of you have made the effort and apologized to Rige once again for not giving her everything on time and just forty-eight hours before. She had no time to advertise also. But thank all of you. I really let's have tea together, coffee, whatever. Thank you.